So that's, uh, that information is, will be from 3 to 5 in the afternoon next Sunday, May 2nd. The three questions for the sermon. Number one, what are the three little wiles? What are the three little wiles? Number two, what are the three types of Christian suffering? What are the three types of Christian suffering? And number three, how can suffering give you comfort now? How can suffering give you comfort now? Please turn your bulletins over and let us recite together the, that portion of our uh, small catechism below the weekly schedule. The sacrament of the altar, part one. <clears throat> what is the sacrament of the altar? It is the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ under the bread and wine, instituted by Christ himself for us Christians to eat and to drink. Where is this written? The holy evangelists Matthew, Mark, Luke, and St. Paul write, Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Thank you.
Beloved of the Lord, let us draw near with true heart to confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who made heaven and earth. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you, you forgave the iniquity of my sin. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, the poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death, of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a force is of me. Upon this year confession, I, by virtue of my office, as of old, and ordained servant of the Word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead, and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
you show those in error the light of your truth, so that they may return to the way of righteousness. Grant faithfulness to all who are admitted into the fellowship of Christ's church, that they may avoid whatever is contrary to their confession, and follow all such things as are pleasing to you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Holy uh, the uh, Old Testament lesson for Ju for Jubilate Sunday is from Isaiah chapter forty. To whom then will you compare me, that I should be like him, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings them out of their host by number, calling them all by name, for the greatness of his might, because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? and my right is disregarded by my God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths, shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Epistle lesson is from 1 Peter chapter 2. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they, see, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God in the day of visitation. Be subject, for the Lord's sake, to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme, or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil, to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing, when mindful of God, one endures sorrow while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure? This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow this is the word of the Lord. And yes, 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 yes. God.
says to us, a little while, and you will not see me, and again, a little while, and you will see me, and because I'm going to the Father. So they were saying, what does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he is talking about. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him, so he said to them, is this what you were asking yourselves, what I meant by saying, a little while, and you will not see me? And again, a little while, you will see me. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but the, your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow, because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the aim for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. In that day you will ask nothing of me, truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. This is the Gospel of the Lord.
Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. That portion of God's Word, which we consider today, the Holy Spirit calls be recorded in John chapter 16. Let us pray. These are your words, Heavenly Father, sanctify us by the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Amen. Seven times in our gospel lesson, we hear our Lord say, a little while. Seven is a holy number, as you may know. It symbolizes God's providence and loving care. Three is the number of God, who is three persons, yet one God. Four is the number of the earth. You can think of it as like the four winds. In six days, God created the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day, he rested. Yet God continues to watch over and care for his creation. By repeating the words a little while, seven times in this scripture passage, the Holy Spirit is communicating to us that throughout this little while of suffering, our Lord God is in control. Jesus speaks these words to his disciples in the night in which he was betrayed. This gospel lesson teaches us about the three little whiles. The first is the one which will follow immediately when Jesus is arrested and crucified and laid in a tomb dead. During this little while, the disciples wept and lament, while the chief priests and the Pharisees rejoiced. Yet, this little while ended when Jesus rose from the dead and showed himself to his disciples. The second little while came when Jesus ascended into heaven 40 days after his resurrection. He Jesus will be celebrating that in a couple weeks. Soon afterward, his disciples experienced severe persecution as they proclaimed the gospel that Jesus died for the sins of the world, was raised from the dead, and is now seated at the Father's right hand. That little while ended when the apostles were each granted a Christian death and were received by the Lord Jesus into paradise, where they sit on twelve thrones. The final little while is the little while we currently are suffering in. It is a little while of the holy Christian church on earth in these last days. This little while will end for each of us personally when we die and are received into paradise, and generally for the entire Christian church on earth when Christ returns to judge the living and the dead. His church will rejoice with her head for all eternity. Each of these little whiles has a cross. In the first is the, literal, is the literal cross of Christ Jesus, onto which he was nailed by his hands and feet and languished in unspeakable pain while bearing the guilt of all mankind on his very soul. This is the most important cross which Jesus for a little while bore. Yet our Lord willingly embraced this cross for our sake, desiring our salvation. He knew that he that we could not pay for our sins without bearing them for eternity in hell. So Jesus bore our sins on the cross for us. And although Jesus cried, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me from the cross? He remembered the rest of that scripture, that is Psalm 22, which he quoted, and also declared, I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. Which means that after he had suffered for a little while, the Father would raise him up to comfort his church with the promise of everlasting life. In Jesus' little while of suffering on the cross, God remained in control. This was his plan to win for us salvation. Jesus trusted his Father in the midst of his suffering. The second cross is one born, born metaphorically, but also at times quite literally by the apostles as they suffered shame for the cross of Christ. They were beaten, imprisoned, betrayed, slandered, killed, and even crucified 
for the gospel of Christ. Yet, encouraged by Jesus' words and strengthened by the Holy Spirit, whom Jesus sent to them, they did endure. They considered it, considered it an honor to suffer dishonor for the name of Jesus. They knew that when they finished the race, the race, Christ had an imperishable crown stored up for them in heaven. The third cross is the one we bear as Christians on this earth. Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Jesus says quite plainly that Christians should expect to suffer on this earth. We are called to be willing to lose all things for the sake of gaining Christ. This is the little while Jesus warns us about and for which he provides the greatest comfort. Jesus offers comfort in the face of suffering. The first and most obvious comfort is the fact that he calls it a little while. The Greek word used is where we get the word micro, like microscope or microscopic. It's so small. It won't last. It's going to be over soon. If the, that joy that will come after will last forever. Jesus says that no one will be able to take that joy away. That alone gives comfort as we deal with suffering. That chronic pain that has become normal will come to an end. You will enjoy a happy reunion with your Christian loved ones who have preceded you in death. The temptations that try you and the sins that grieve you will be forgotten forever. Your own death is only temporary. Hallelujah. This is but one reason why St. Paul says that the suffering of this present age is not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed to us. Suffering can be defined as having evil inflicted against you. Suffering is having evil inflicted against you. There are three types of Christian suffering. For all three, Jesus offers immense comfort. The first is godly grief, which leads to repentance. This suffering is when the Lord disciplines us for doing wrong. There is no glory in suffering for doing wrong, and Christians should never glory in sin, whether they suffer for it or not. Yet Christians do sin, and sometimes God permits suffering as a result of sin. This is not like the suffering for the gospel, which is a great honor and blessing to the Christian. Rather, this is a shameful thing. And yet, there is still comfort in it when it leads to repentance. Scripture says godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. And again, Scripture says, for the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. And so, Christians count it a blessing when the Lord corrects them. The psalmist says, let a righteous man strike me, it is a kindness. Let him rebuke me, it is oil for my head. How much more when the Lord disciplines us? On this earth, we have a chance to repent and turn to Christ. By disciplining us now, our Lord spares us from eternal hell. So we find that even when we are disciplined now, it is a kindness from the Lord to turn us back to Him. The second type of Christian suffering is the suffering as a result of living in a fallen world where sin and death reign. So it doesn't can't correlate it to a sin that you've done, or even a good that you've done. Here, Christians are particularly, particularly comforted because we know that Christ has taken away all our guilt and has won the battle against death. We're not ashamed of this suffering. The wicked will not prevail. And we're not afraid of this suffering. Death has lost its sting. We should not fear death. There's no sickness that can defeat us. 
What are cancer? Stroke. Heart failure, Parkinson's, arthritis, and all the other maladies that plague us. But millions of death. But our Lord Jesus Christ has defeated death. So how can the minions, these mere servants of death, conquer us when our Lord has vanquished their master and given us the victory? This is what we mean when we cry, O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? Christ has taken away the sting of death by washing away our sins. And so we are comforted in the suffering of our bodies and in the turmoil of the earth because we know that the victory belongs to us and that this is only temporary. Yet, when, yet more than that, we see our suffering as an opportunity to shed our old Adam. We must drown and die every day. We repent of our sins, knowing that the new man will rise to live forever. We cast out our idols, whether they're money or pleasures of life, good health or long life, knowing that Christ Jesus as, uh, that in Christ Jesus, even if we die, we will live forever. And our loved ones who die in the Lord will live forever as well. This does not mean that Christian, uh, as Christians we should not mourn death. Jesus says that we will mourn now. We will weep now. But we do not mourn as those who have no hope. Rather, we maintain hope in our eternal joy, even in the midst of sorrow. The third and primary type of Christian suffering is the suffering on account of faith in Christ. This is the suffering Jesus is speaking of when he says, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. And as with the other types of suffering, this suffering, too, will end after a little while. Then our sorrow will turn into joy, and it will never be taken away from us. Yet, this third type of suffering also brings joy and comfort here and now. Suffering has been described as crying out no to God in complaint. And this makes sense as we look at the Psalms of Lamentation of the Bible. There are many of them. But one is uh, Psalm 94. O Lord, how long shall the wicked, how long shall the wicked exalt? Of course, there is Psalm 22, which Jesus recited from the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so it seems strange that suffering could produce joy in its midst, even before that little while has passed. But listen to the words of our Lord Jesus. Blessed are you, when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account, rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Jesus tells us to rejoice when we suffer on account of him, because it is a sign that we are his and that we will inherit the kingdom of heaven. This is why the apostles rejoiced when they were beaten for preaching about Jesus in the temple, because they had suffered dishonor for the name of Christ and gave them confidence in their salvation. Now, I do feel compassion for my fellow Christians who suffer for confessing Christ. The Christians who are frequently murdered in the Middle East for going to church. That pastor in Canada who was imprisoned for holding church services. And his congregation now, who is barred from worshiping in public, they have to do it in secret. Christians who are maligned and slandered as haters by their family and acquaintances and so-called friends, because they still believe what the Bible teaches about sexual morality and the distinction between men and women. I have deep sympathy for the suffering of these Christians. Yet I am much more concerned and 
fearful for those who do not recognize the suffering of the Christian church, who laugh and rejoice along with the world while Christians are weeping and lamenting the evil inflicted upon them. I am fearful for them because they are losing sight of Christ. One of the fruits of saving faith is, is suffering with Christ because the world hated him first. This fruit, while bitter for a while, a little while, is a comforting sign that you are in good company. Our Lord Jesus endured suffering for our sake so that he could pay for our sins, but also to set us an example so that we can learn to suffer in faith and find comfort in suffering. Romans 5 states more than that, we rejoice in our suffering, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, character, hope, and hope does not put to shame because God's love has been poured in, out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. When we recognize that we are suffering on account of Christ, we rejoice knowing that we will not be put to shame before God. And when we learn that the suffering is a tool to shed the old Adam and gain endurance for the course before us, well then we look at suffering in a different my fellow Christians, let us find such purpose in our suffering so that we may gain endurance for this little while before our joy is made full forever. Amen. Amen. Please rise. <clears throat> the peace of God which surpasses all understanding of your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.
that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. According to your promise, O God, be the defender of the widow and the father of the orphan, relieve and comfort the sick and sorrowful, especially Marilyn Walters, Caitlin Clark, Lloyd Eskew, Don Bailey, Bob and Barbara Francis, Carly Gibbons, Bob Sealer, Janice Manning, Lynn Blackwell, Angie Scott, Ruth Kudur, Steve Rasmussen, Heidi Parker, Paul Rabbis, Wayne and Patty Carter, Martin Webster, Lily Archer, Dan Leslie, Amy Cork, Jerry Bainbridge, Caitlin Lewis, Olivia Gilker, Caitlin Brown, Tasha Jensen, Clarence Huck, Judy Falls, Linda Ford, Nick Nitschke, and the, all who, the family of who mourned the death of Jerry Ford. Graciously help those who are assaulted by the devil and who are in the peril of death. With the strength of those who are suffering for the sake of Christ's holy name, grant that we may live together in peace and prosperity, bestow upon us good and seasonable weather, and bless us with the bright Christian counsel and all that we undertake. We especially commend to your care and keeping this your congregation, which you have bought with a great price. Keep from us all offenses and bind us together in the unity of your holy love. Grant that the little ones who are baptizing your name may be brought up in your fear. At your table, give to those who there commune with you peace and life everlasting. Be merciful, O God, to all according to your great love in Christ Jesus our Lord. When our final hour shall come, grant us a blessed departure from this world, and on the last day, a resurrection to your glory. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you.
to come, and will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Our good Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed to prayer, and when he had given thanks, he <coughs> broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take it, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Take and eat, this is the true body of Christ, given to death for you. Take and eat, this is the true body of Christ, given into death for you. Take and eat, this is the true body of Christ, given into death for you. Take and drink, this is the true blood of Christ, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins.
Lord bless thee, you would strengthen us to the same and faith toward you, and firm in love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord be with you. 